Yes, we can hear you.
thank you Gabriel. so my my question is that uh, so as one of the first movers towards the adoption of the exposure alert protocols developed by apple and google uh, what issues are highlighted by uruguay's experience so far and and to what extent is the app compatible with the country's robust data protection laws and in this case also uh, how has the state gone about managing accountability given the leading role that the private sector has uh, played in developing this app thank you
sources from official sources, uh, especially at a time like this. So basically it's the Ministry of Health uh, that gives you uh, numbers, that gives you data, that gives you counts, that gives you information about what to do in, in if, you know, if you get uh, sick or if a loved one gets sick. And there is absolutely, or there, there is usually no way to double check or to verify the information. So whatever you get from these official sources are basically, you know, the way to go in, in, in situations uh, like this. And many times, unfortunately, the citizens are not getting enough information and that's really where uh, the danger uh, is. So we, really, we have so many questions and we don't have much answers. We don't know, you know, what data are, are the governments gathering in the name of COVID-19? Of COVID what, what data are they gathering now that they have not previously been gathering because we don't know, you know, what they're gathering on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but, but what's different now, you know, are all the data that they're gathering actually necessary to combat the situation that we're in? Are the data being protected or encrypted? How? Uh, what happens if that data is compromised one way or, or the other? Are the data being shared with law enforcement agents? Uh, and again, you know, on, on what basis? How are the data stored? Uh, how are they used? Uh, and, and then of course, you know, the sunset clause, you know, when, when will these programs end? Uh, hopefully there is an end to the pandemic, you know, what, what are we going to do with that data afterwards? Where, where does that data go? How long does it, does it remain after the pandemic ends? And what kind of accountability exists to make sure that governments do not retain such data when it's no longer needed or do not use it in, in ways in which it was not supposed to be used. Um, in, in North Africa, uh, there have been several attempts at, uh, at contact tracing and data gathering apps. Uh, Egypt has one called Sahet Masr, uh, Egypt's Health. It's an official app by the Ministry of Health. Uh, supposedly to raise awareness of, of the pandemic. It has over uh, 1 million downloads, uh, which you need to know. I mean, Egypt is a, is a large population relatively. We're, we're 100 million people. So, you know, that's like 1% of the population. It's, uh, the download is voluntary. Um, however, there are many reviews on the app that says that even after entering your personal information, the app doesn't really work very effect effectively. Uh, you have to enter a copy of your a national ID or passport, and you have to enter your phone number, uh, and the app automatically uh, gathers your location information at all times, even if you're not using uh, the app. Uh, Tunisia also has uh, one such app. It's called Ehmi or Protect. Again, they uh, collect GPS location. Uh, phone number is required for, for registration, and again, no sunset clause. Uh, Morocco has one called Wukaidna uh, or Our Protection. Uh, developed by the Ministry of Interior, and it had over a million downloads in, in a week. And, uh, and uh, Morocco is a much smaller population, well, about 40 million, so but smaller than Egypt anyway. So usually the policies are generic. They're not very clear. Uh, I tried to look for like, uh, you know, terms of privacy on, on the Egyptian app. I, I couldn't find any. Um, and, and again, you have, you have to give all this, you know, you have to give in a copy of your ID, your phone number, your uh, location, your contacts. I mean, it, 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 your, your media files it has access to a lot of data uh, that you have to wonder. And people have actually written comments like that on the reviews, like, why, why do you want my media files? You know, what are you going to do with this? Um, and I'm sure there are answers, but you know, you, you kind of have to wonder, isn't this a little bit too much uh, information? Uh, South Africa, for example, has a much better app. It's, uh, you know, it, the identity is uh, anonymized, the user consent to reporting if someone, uh, if someone tests positive, you, you, you obviously need to report that, uh, but no personal information or location is, uh, is collected. So, you know, that's a, that's a better model. Uh, on the other hand, given that uh, much of uh, the efforts to combat the pandemic de depends on actually delivering accurate and timely information in a timely manner, the question then becomes what happens to people on the low end of the digital divide? And unfortunately, we have quite a few in, you know, in, the, uh, in, North, in Africa in general and in the Arab world, of course. Um, Egypt has, a, has an internet penetration rate of about 50% which is not bad, uh, a phone penetration of about 95 to 100%, depending on, on uh, you know, the population figure that they take into account for the calculation. Uh, 
however, the I mean, that doesn't mean that everybody has a mobile phone because, you know, many people have two so or three. So, you know, we still have quite a few people who are off that radar. We actually have about a third of the population still who are who don't have basic literacy skills. They cannot even read and write. So how will these citizens get access to the basic, basic critical health information that is needed to survive a pandemic like this? Uh, I believe governments have a duty to provide this basic information to everybody, to all citizens, uh, regardless of their access to uh, technology and their access to information, because you know this is a matter of life and death, obviously. So um, th there are many questions to be asked. There, are un Unfortunately, there are actually more questions than answers uh, coming out of, of uh, our part of the world. Uh, once again, I will just stress the, the very key elements that I believe uh, are, are for everything to be centered about basically data and information because you know that's how you survive the pandemic but also transparency and accountability uh, you know we have we cannot we cannot uh, let our guard down we have to be very vigilant and we have to be very careful what information is being gathered who has access to it and and um, how is this information being treated basically i'll stop here thank you thank you so much doctor um, finally, on the panel, I'll turn to Amber Sina. Amber is the Executive Director of the Centre for Internet and Society in India. At CIS, Amber has led projects on privacy, digital identity, artificial intelligence and misinformation. Amber's research has been cited with appreciation by the Supreme Court of India. He is a member of the steering committee of About ML, an initiative to bring diverse perspectives to develop, test and implement machine learning systems system documentation practices. His first book, The Network Public, was released in 2019. Amber studied law and humanities at Na the National Law School of India University in Bangalore. Thank you so much, Amber. Thanks a lot. And, so, and thanks to my previous panelists as well. I think I'll uh, continue in a similar vein to where I think Russia left off. Uh, so what we see is that the pandemic has led to a fair bit of what we may call techno-socialism, traditionalism in large parts of the world. The use of digital contact tracing apps, immunity passports, in some cases even usage of drones to watch over a particular area have been seen fairly commonly. And what we also see is a greater emphasis on digital solutions leading to greater generation of data. Uh, which has been seen as critical to the healthcare sector's response to the pandemic. And alongside, uh, these technological solutions have also had a fair bit of negative impact, particularly on members of marginalized communities, which may have led to the stigmatization and discrimination in certain cases. So every humanitarian crisis throws up fairly expedient responses. And often in these responses, we view fundamental and human rights as mere obstacles in its way. And it's easy to be swayed by the enormity of the crisis, particularly a crisis of, uh, of an unprecedented scale, such as COVID-19. Now, in, in the rush to introduce digital methods of contact tracing, concerns around privacy, surveillance, potential discrimination and exclusion, have in a large number of countries gone unaddressed. And what Governments in various countries haven't kept in mind is that digital contact tracing cannot replace manual contact tracing. And successful tracing is often a result of manual and digital contact tracing working in tandem, as well as uh, digital sort of solutions often work on, uh, often depend on, on several sort of analog solutions as well as analog practice to exist. So in a country like India, it's limited uh, sort of internet penetration. The question must be asked about to what extent something like digital contact tracing works. Secondly, if you don't have a sufficient number of testing, sufficient quantum of testing being done in particular geography, how useful is it to rely on digital contact tracing or other digital solutions as uh, sort of valid responses to the pandemic? And what has been most uh, disappointing in a lot of countries is also that in a world of techno-social solutionism, where an app is the answer to all our problems evidently, it's even more worrying when the solutions don't use the full scope of technology as it's uh, 
uh, discourse to respond meaningfully to the problem statements that we face. Some of the, uh, I think, examples that we uh, discussed in the first part of this session, particularly those highlighted by Kamil uh, do uh, sort of give an overview of the kind of privacy preserving technologies that can be deployed. Yet, if we do, uh, if we review uh, the technologies being deployed in various parts of the world, we often don't uh, include those privacy preserving aspects in the technological design. So, for instance, with regard to contact tracing, the authorities need only know who comes in contact with a contagious user, not the proximity history of all users. Even when a non-contagious user has come in contact with a contagious user, without uploading their data to the cloud, other features of the app could access anonymized data on the server about contact contagious uh, users and, and locally analyze the potential contact with somebody who may be an infection carrier. So, this could allow for equally effective contact tracing by also ensuring data minimization, preventing surveillance of uh, non-contagious users. And even the data of contagious users can be secured, shared only after anonymization, and only with a small set of uh, bodies with clear access control mechanisms that do require it for decision making and can be deleted after the purpose is met. Over the last uh, year and a half, we created an evaluation framework to begin with design for digital identity systems. And uh, in the last six months, what we've tried to do is we try to adapt this framework also for uh, the use of digital solutions in response to COVID-19. Our evaluation framework essentially consists of three kinds of tests. The first kind of test is do the flaw test where uh, our rule of law principle essentially mandates that the governing, there, should, there must be a governing law which should be enacted by the legislature. It must be devoid of excessive delegation, be clear and accessible to the public, and be precise and limiting in its scope for discretion. The second category of tests that we uh, articulated were rights-based tests, where the entire technological framework, including its architecture, usage, actors, and regulators, must be evaluated at every stage against the rights that it may potentially violate. And only then will we be able to determine if such violation is necessary and proportionate to the benefit that the technological system in that specific instance offers. And finally, what we felt was necessary was also risk-based test, where uh, technological systems, which may have an impact on human rights, must be based on analysis of the risk that the system introduces. So those risks could be in the form of a centralized and federated uh, data storage framework, it could be based on the effects of potential failures or breaches, or uh, of uh, restricting the uses or usage of the technology to limited actors that will benefit from breaching. So an implicit in the risk-based assessment framework is also the requirement of implementing a responsive mitigation strategy to the risks identified. So we use this framework to look at the digital contact tracing solution in India, and our partners in Latin America in ITSU also conducted studies based on our framework to look into mobile apps deployed in Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, and Brazil. And largely what we felt was uh, there is limited compliance with rights-based principles that I just articulated. There is very little risk analysis or mitigation plans that are in place in either of the systems. In a lot of cases, even the basic rule of law tests were not in place in the sense that there was no legislative framework that uh, governed the application or the deployment of the solution. And in some cases, there was other protocols often left to the discretion of the executive to change it at its uh, discretion. So largely what we felt was that the while digital identity solutions were being uh, deployed, while there was al also technological uh, systems that could lead to more privacy preserving responses uh, and regulatory frameworks which would govern them, most of the, that knowledge and capacity was being ignored in the rush to respond to the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, just like at the end of part one, we'll for the uh, end of part two, before we turn on to the general Q&A, we have some crossover questions. And the first question is from Gonzalo to Clayton. Yeah, 
sorry. Uh, hi, Clayton. Uh, could you share uh, with us some best practices regarding personal data management in the deployment of digital solutions, such as health applications? Certainly. So um, I've wh what I've done also, there was a question on this in the in the chat where I've, I've shared some some of the details, but basically there are a number of things which countries are generally doing in terms of best practices that we can draw upon. So firstly, as many of the speakers today have highlighted, looking at the technical architecture design, both in terms of how individuals gain access to that and privacy surrounding it. Uh, transparency is who is accessing the data, having expert accountability and oversight legal safeguards and important, including public civil society and the scientific community in the development of systems. It's, a, it's often an area which people uh, neglect. Um, addressing aspects of, of data sensitivity, quality and minimization are also very important, as well as data security measures. And it sounds very banal in a way, but we've seen uh, examples where data security has been lax and that has had uh, consequences which have been uh, widespread. Uh, and I think also looking at the trade-offs between uh, sharing data and uh, not sharing data and looking at this from an ethical perspective and a privacy preserving perspective and seeing whether the risk is commensurate to the potential gain. And it's not a thought process countries often go through. Uh, you yourself, Gonzalo, mentioned data protection impact assessments, and that's just one tool to help guide countries through that measure. Other best practice perspectives are perhaps a little bit more on the practical side. So for example, integrating the many silo data sources around the health information system together into one portal for easy access by citizens. That's something that's quite un undervalued, but when implemented correctly really has an amazing uh, impact in providing transparency and accessibility to data. Having meaningful, meaningful consent been, built into not only those types of systems, but also when individuals are accessing other points of either care or public health from the national health information system or national health system is important. Having policies that stipulate that information is only needed to be provided by an individual once. That sounds again, very simplistic, but it, uh, having those policies in place is actually quite difficult to reflect across a very disparate dis uh, digital information system. So again, that eliminates that people are inputting the same information again and again and again to authorities, which I'm sure we've all experienced is a great burden and exposes the risk of misinformation or information that gets out of sync. Having logging of access and sunsetting of data is something that's also been mentioned. And I think um, logging is one of those best practices which has now become uh, very mainstreamed within the European region. So that now people have an inbuilt expectation that whenever access, their record perhaps is, is accessed, then there is a clear log of who access, access the data and for what purpose, which is a very important element into it. And then finally, building digital health literacy into populations. I can't really overemphasize how important that is, including strengthening the health workforce in their ability to use data. They're the types of best practices that we see and we want to see again, echoed more and more in the development of national health information systems to, uh, to protect privacy to the greatest extent that we can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clayton. And dealing with one of the questions in the Q&A, so two for one. Uh, the next question was from Robin to Russia. Hi, thank you. Um, so Russia, I, I really appreciated your comments um, in, in your initial remarks on how important it is to have access to, to good information. And so I was hoping you could talk more about um, what effect um, COVID has had on government's behaviors when it comes to fundamental rights like freedom of expression, press freedom and access to information. You know, is anyone leading by example and what steps are they taking that others should be looking to as guidance? And then conversely, uh, you know, are there more dr draconian measures that you're seeing being put in place? And what are the harms that you see come from those measures? Um, and, and what can we as a community of individuals who are committed to the governance of an open, free and secure internet do to respond to those harmful measures? Thank you, Robin. That's a very important question. Um, honestly, I don't think I've seen much difference. Um, you know, we we do have a problem, of course, with with freedom of expression in our in our part of the world, and I I think it's it's uh, I mean it's been there since before COVID nineteen, so I don't really think it has been much impacted by that. 
uh, I think the the danger is more of a of a potential danger of gathering too much information uh, without knowing, you know, where this information is going or or what's happening to it. Uh, I I cannot think of um, of any examples of something that's that's happened that was too drastic that was because of the pandemic uh, in in particular. I think it's just you know normal day to day business which is usually not not. Uh, not the best, let's put it this way. But uh, but I can't I can't think of a particular difference uh, because because of the pandemic. Actually, uh, I just think it's it's the the overall potential for abuse that's really uh, that's really threatening and that we should be very very uh, careful about because the problem is when you have a, a situation where there is a real danger and obviously this is a real dangerous situation. You have more of of a potential approval by citizens to willingly give in uh, more of their freedoms, to willingly give in information, to willingly give in, uh, you know, to being monitored if uh, if somebody says that this is necessary to keep you safe. So I think it's that potential abuse that we that we need to be very careful about. Thank you, Russia. Uh, the final question is from. Carmela to Amber. Uh, thank you, Gabriela. Uh, Amber, thank you much for your intervention. Uh, my question is about the use of data-driven technology. So we have recently seen that some of them have created problems like face recognition or automated grading, have seen kind of the downside of this. And, and I'm going to link this a little bit to a question that we also have in the Q&A for the two for one uh, from Mohammed, who says that uh, data in COVID-19 is actually not normal data, so we don't even know how ML uh, can react, uh, what can it cause. And my question is, in your experience, what is the best way of trying to avoid these pitfalls in practice? And it is a question of a design, so we, we need to go back to the drawing board and redesign some of these technologies, or is this really something we can solve on deployment? Thanks a lot, Kamila. I mean, I there are definitely steps that can be taken at the deployment stage. So some of the, the examples that I was talking about in my earlier intervention, as far as the existence of a regulatory framework, as far as uh, creating risk-based assessment uh, frameworks, having access control mechanisms. So there are definitely things that can be done at the deployment, but uh, particularly the kind of technologies that you mentioned, things like facial recognition technology, we need to look at the overall design of the technology as well is uh, what we are essentially doing more and more is using what have been traditionally surveillance technology for the purposes of welfare dispersal, for the purposes of uh, sort of protecting and preserving economic, social, and uh, <coughs> economic and social rights as well. So the, to what extent do these technologies inherent, are inherently biased can be uh, given the, the sort of in the inequitous data sets that they are looking at will lead to discriminatory and exclusionary impacts. There, I do think that the design, uh, the overall design of the technology must be looked at. And if you just look at the principle of proportionality, which essentially requires that uh, when you deploy a solution, then it must be, uh, it's, it's required that there isn't a less rights preserving, but equally effective solution that exists. Something like facial recognition technology, which is essentially a remote uh, covert surveillance technology in some sense. Uh, the, the question must be asked, uh, then there must be very, very limited circumstances where you don't have uh, more rights preserving and less risky alternatives. So you must use it. So I think both at the level of the, of the overall design of the technology itself, as well as uh, at the deployment stage in order to recognize then those risks and take clear steps to mitigate them. We, look at, we need to look at the problem fairly holistically. Excellent, thank you so much, Amber. Um, so we'll turn now to the remaining questions from the Q&A. Um, I'll read through them quickly and then give each panelist in the same order a minute or two to try and address them if you can or, or, or not. Um, the first is a question about data literacy and the fact that 
as data breaches become more of a cross-border problem with uh, with disparate levels of data literacy, uh, do panelists agree that one of the ways to provide trust is to increase the role of, of national data protection authorities when it comes to cross-border transfers, but I suppose also when it comes to data practices in general. Um, the next question um, from, oh, uh, disappeared. Um, is it possible to discuss how we can address data retention regimes across the world? Noting there is a cloud agreement being drafted between Australia and the US, which will give more access to data between the two major states, um, which I suppose also links somewhat to the DPA, but any other suggestions people might have on cross-border data transfer and regulation, as complicated as that question may be. Um, the next question is, um, since many countries don't have data protection laws yet, which we see, how can data collection um, be accounted for during and after the pandemic? Um, and I think related to that is part of the difficulties that we see in you know, advancing principle-based regulation and advancing human rights principles, which are lovely, but sometimes you know, in our attempts to get normative standards, that are broadly, you know, agreeable enough, how do we whittle those down in particular contexts uh, in a way that's useful? Um, and then there is another question that says, at the IGF, we devote a lot of time and attention to best practices. Uh, what can we learn from worst practices? Which of course is always a great question. So I'll give each panelist an opportunity to answer those questions and then let's see how we go, given we're already running out of time. Thank you. Sorry, we'll start with Clayton. Sorry, I'll go in the order. <laughs> Thank you, Rilla. I wasn't quite sure. Um, let me let me take on the question on uh, the. I think it was the first one on on data governance. How can we ensure this if there's an absence of, of data regulation already existing within a country? I think the simple answer is you can't. Um, and and again, this is one of kind of like the foundational uh, aspects that need to be implemented in countries to ensure that all the elements of of transparency and good data governance are actually um, valid. So uh, what will quite likely happen is that under the auspices of COVID-19, certain data will be gathered um, and there will be some uncertainty as to what the data is actually being used for beyond uh, the kind of the basic elements of public health uh, surveillance and, and social measures implementation. Um, and really what's, what, what I think is important then is that we have an exchange of best practices from other countries shared widely and globally so that we can see particularly some of the really good examples that have come out of the European Union and other countries around the world of where data protection regulation has actually had a very positive benefit both in terms of not only controlling the data flow but actually raising awareness to the potential risks that we've discussed in the, in the session today. Um, so I know that's probably not, not the, uh, the answer that you're hoping for but I think really we have to be frank without the basic elements in place then really there isn't a foundation for the house to be stable. Um, so let, let's be honest here and say that we need to work harder to make sure that governments are held accountable uh, for the data that, uh, that they hold in that uh, from the public. Thank you so much, Clayton. Um, Dr. Russia? Oh, thank you. I, unfortunately, I agree with everything that Clayton just said. Uh, you know, I mean, in, in my part of the world, there aren't even data protection laws uh, much. And so, you, you know, there's there's nothing you can rely on. Uh, and even if there, they were, honestly, I mean, uh, still not, not a guarantee that, you know, the data is not going to be misused or abused in, in any way. I think the best thing that we can do right now is just as, as uh, an international community and as a civic society and as... Uh, you know, uh, international organizations from the United Nations to the WHO to, you know, whoever can speak up to just try to apply pressure so that the data collected are as, uh, as minimal as possible, as absolutely necessary as possible, and to make sure that, that uh, 
you know, we, we will keep asking where, where is this data going and, and how long will it be retained for and, and how will it be used? We might not get any answers, but we, we need to keep asking anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Um, finally, Amber. Uh, th thank you. I'll try to quickly take the remaining questions. Uh, I think the question from Juliana talks about uh, the fact that various countries don't have a protection, data protection law yet. I mean, one of the things to uh, potentially look at, that, uh, look at is even when countries don't have data protection law, like for instance, India doesn't have one. But there, if there is a recognized fundamental right to privacy, Often that right to privacy in itself includes a positive obligation on the state to create rules under which uh, the personal data of citizens must be protected even from private actors. So in that sense, that there may even the absence of, of a proper framework, there might be other legal mechanisms that one can look at uh, to potentially create rules, particularly if, if rules need to be created urgently during the pandemic because technological systems are being deployed. Uh, I think Michael's question about uh, worst practices is, is a very interesting one. And uh, that also uh, relates to the point about risk assessment that I was uh, making. So something, uh, risk assessment also looks at uh, both the likelihood of a risk as well as the severity of a risk. So in certain cases, you, something might be a very remote risk, a fairly dystopian sort of out there scenario. Uh, but those things also need to be addressed because the even if there is a low likelihood in the event that that remote risk does occur, its uh, impact can be extremely severe. And I think the final question was about how we can ensure uh, that no entity can use issues data for privilege to make geopolitical goals. That, that's that's a difficult one because uh, more and more what we do see is there is a narrative uh, about data as an asset uh, in various countries. Uh, countries are interested in creating uh, silos in which they want to uh, provide some protectionism around use of data. So first, I think we will have to get to some degree of convergence around principles for data sharing and uh, are there any beneficial interests that lie in the generation of data. Once those principles are converged, then perhaps we can think about uh, some manner of a global data governance scheme. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, thank you to all Dr. Russia, controversial. Uh, but maybe what I'll allow everybody to do is you can even give me your word of the day, which might be a quicker way of wrapping up our, our session. So I'll give Robin a chance, and Gonzala, then Camilla, then Clayton, then Dr. Russia, then Amber a chance to give their word of the day before I wrap up. Maybe they 10 seconds. Thank you. I'll keep this brief. Um, I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity to speak on this uh, illustrious panel. Um, and, and I've learned so much just from listening to all of the other panelists. Um, I think, you know, one of the biggest takeaways we've seen from the COVID pandemic um, and, and government's response and, and the private sector response is the importance of establishing privacy protective um, responses that enable uh, getting good and actionable information to, to citizens and, and individuals living um, in places that have, uh, you know, significant uh, infection rates. Um, that don't for that matter. Um, and making sure also that um, people can trust um, their government's response to be effective and to be responsible um, and to make sure that data is only being used um, in a way that is expected and, and that will be um, contributing to, to the pandemic response and not for other unrelated purposes. Thank you. I believe it's my turn, Gabriela. It is, yes, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, just also a quick word, um, reminding us of the importance of uh, remembering that uh, personal data is a fundamental right of the individuals. So uh, the respect to data protection principles, such as data minimization, purpose limitation, accountability, security of data, respect of obligations, rights, particularly when collecting information prior to the collection, deletion when uh, the purpose has ended are, are very important. And also I, like, I would like to, to, to point out the importance of uh, international and homogeneous standards 
such as the ones that are reflected in Convention 108. Because with the homogeneous standards, we can well also speak, all, all of us speak the same language. Amanda. Thank you everyone for, for a very enlightening panel. Uh, I think that my final word is that I have heard a lot, how can we do for data protection to data retention to how do we ensure not use of data? Well, maybe again, we need to rethink the way we build system and whether data is actually the only path forward. I have heard the sentence, well, if this is the only one, we maybe must use it. Well, maybe not. And maybe there is another way of redesigning. And this pandemic and how much the importance of systems and how we build systems have come into play may be a good opportunity to rethink whether data is the new oil or data is the new excuse to collect data. Thank you. Uh, Clayton? Word of the day, data governance, accountability and transparency. I think uh, we are really just at uh, the beginning of the curve in understanding what it means to establish national data governance mechanisms. Uh, there's a lot that can be learned from countries, but really we're going through a, a new phase of enlightenment for the use of data. And I think there's the potential there that can and, and will be tapped. So let's embrace it head on and make sure that we do it in such a way that privacy is respected and that inequalities are reduced. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Thank you. I seem to be, uh, uh, Clayton seems to be saying like exactly what I want to say. So I'll just uh, <laughs> reiterate what he said, really data availability, data accessibility and accountability and transparency. These are the key words for me. Thank you. Amber? I, I'll probably borrow from what Michael said, I think, earlier. I think we need to think about worst case scenarios as we uh, design new systems. We need to think about dystopian futures as we deploy them. So let's not, uh, the narrative should not just not be a positive rosy one, uh, which eventually leads to uh, exclusionary and discriminatory impact for national community. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And you're so good with your time limits. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for getting together today um, to discuss data governance. I think there are principles that we can generally start to agree on. But I think if there is one thing that we learn from looking at COVID-19, um, that there's a common narrative that's tried to, you know, phrase the understand the position as being, we're going to introduce technology now. Um, so, you know, what are the privacy preserving ways that we can do that? And I think when you look at a broad spectrum of context, we understand that the real question um, first, the first question is, what are the environments we're actually looking at? What are the needs on those environments? And in what way does technology and data or data help in, <laughs> to you know, meet those ends? That human rights allows us to understand that if we want things to be balanced, a lot of that is about understanding if they're less restrictive means, but also understanding if they're effective means and that data and technology are not the be all and end all. Um, although they can be, <laughs> you know, if they use right. But fundamentally, the first question is about if you're going to implement something, ensuring that the essential data governance frameworks are in place. And if those priorities aren't a priority now after what we've seen in COVID-19, then I think we might be beating our heads against a wall for a lot longer. So um, that's my closing up. And I'd just like to thank everybody for coming in today. Um, and I think you were all wonderful. So thanks again. And thank you to Maria for bringing us all together. <laughs>